Hello, uh, people. This video that you're about to watch now has been there on the public domain uh, from Arise TV News, uh, Dr. Ruben Alberti and uh, the rest. But the most uh, unique thing is our brother who really explained what we have been uh, using many means to explain to people. There are no mainstream Igbos. There are no greater Igbo. There are no smaller Igbo. Every Igbo are all one and equal. Just watch this video. I don't want to talk too much. Just watch this video and clear your doubts. Thank you. As indigenous of the five southern states pursue their quest for the emergence of a Nigerian president of Igbo origin in 2023, they have been accused of shutting the doors against other Igbo subgroups, chiefly from the south-south geopolitical zone. According to indigenous of Anioma, Ikwere, Eche, Ibani, Ukwane, and Ikastok, they share the same social cultural systems, language, and ancestry with their brethren in the five southeast states. They are also contending that it will be undemocratic to subvert the rights of Igbos who are not domiciled in the southeast for the quest for an Igbo president come 2023. To discuss the push for a Nigerian president of Igbo origin and the views expressed by the Igbo subgroups in Nigeria, which have often been accused by Southeasterners of only identifying with them when it is expedient. We are now being joined by Chike Ogea, Managing Director of McFoley Hospitality Limited and former Commissioner for Information in this state. Good morning, Chike Ogea, and welcome to the show. And let me welcome you specially in Professor uh, Akintene was uh, uh, manner. Chike, chike, oge, uh, chike, chike. <laughs> anyway, it's good to have you. <laughs> it's good. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you on the program. Nice to do a rufai as well. Nice to see you. Anyway, very quickly. Yes. Looks like everybody wants to be a president. And uh, you are from the Anuma Ushimili side of the uh, of the River Niger, and uh, you know we hear that uh, people who are not mainstream Igbos, the Igbos in Delta, the Igbos in uh, rivers, uh, they are also saying, look, if there's going to be the zoning of the presidency of Nigeria to uh, you know the southeast, then those who pay the price. Uh, as, uh, well, permit me to use the word, uh, Igbo subgroups, you know, uh, are also good enough to represent Igbos. But the dilemma here is that people from all the other ethnic groups that we mentioned, they also belong to the South-South. They are not mainstream Igbos. So why is this, uh, you know, a big issue about we are also Igbos? You know, because if the thing goes to Igbo land, we too are part of the uh, Igbos. And if so, who are your favorite uh, candidates, possible candidates, from the marginal uh, Igbo groups? Fine, Ruben. Thank you for having me once again. Uh, you made a comment which resonated with me, and that is one of the main reasons why I'm here this morning. You talked about mainstream Igbo. What, what is that? I don't think there's anything called mainstream Igbo. Because, um, you see, if we go back a little bit in history, even from the coup that brought, um, that truncated Nigerians' democracy, as far as I'm concerned, and put us in the quandary we seem to be in in 1966, one of the major participants was a young man called, he was a major, um, Zogu. He's from Okmanam. Okmanam is just two minutes away from Asaba. It's more or less the same place as Asaba, which makes him an Oshimilo Igbo person. Um, from that axis, the Anyocha Oshimili area, we speak exactly the same kind of... When I have a discussion with any brother of mine across the Niger, he understands what I'm saying. There might be little, little fluctuations of one dial, I mean, one word. Uh, we can say Shinne, they can say Rinne, you know, and little things like that. But in the main, it is the same dialect, it is the same language. Now, when you look at even the effort of the Biafran war, you know, and I want to talk about personal experience here, um, you will see that the Oshimili and Nyocha Igbos were even the ones that bore most of the brunt of that war. 
both in terms of, of course, the Asaba massacre is known to everybody. I don't think any town, either in the southeast or anywhere in Nigeria, suffered as much as the Asaba people did with the kind of killings and the program that went on in Asaba on that fateful day. Why was that so? If you think those people, I mean, the federal troops did not have enough intelligence to tell them that this town was solidly behind the Biafran agitation. My late father was a medical doctor who was practicing in Benin at the time when the Civil War broke out. I was barely six years old, my two elder sisters. And my mom is of the Yoruba extraction. She had a choice of taking us to her parents in the Badon where they were living. But she said, no, wherever my husband is going, I'm going to go with my husband. And they put us in two cars and we went across. They went to look for an old friend of his, that they were all in Benin, who lived in Oka, Chief Dom Mosu Njikoka, as they called him. And we stayed with him in his house in Oka. And both families became one. And thereafter, we ran from one town to the other throughout the 30 months of the Biafran Civil War. Obviously, if my father did not take us away, Possibly I might not even have been here because the children were killed, women were killed. There is no family in Asaba that did not suffer the loss of one person or the other, a man, woman, or child. Because don't forget, when those federal troops came to Asaba, the idea was that, oh, come and welcome the federal troops, they are here. And they all gathered, they gathered the people in the open field, and then they opened fire on them. So whenever I hear this talk, about Igbo presidency, and people are trying to say there is some subgroup of Igbo or there is mainstream Igbo, it doesn't resonate with me. Because, you see, the Anyoma people, or rather the Ash Oshimili Anyocha people, will always be shortchanged in Nigeria. Let me tell you a little story. In 1999, when the new um, um, democracy started, it was everywhere, it was an open secret that the person that was tipped to be the secretary to the federation at that time was Chief Philip Asiodu. He, was, he is my godfather, he is my uncle, he took me into government. We all know his antecedents, super palm sec, you know, very cerebral and everything. He's one of the custodians of Nigerian history and political economy and everything. And he was supposed to be the secretary to the government of, the, you know, the, of Nigeria at that time. And just before the announcement was made, they decided that, oh no, since a Southeasterner, an Igbo man, was going to be number three, that is the Senate president, you know, the Wazobia thing, there was going to be a president from the West, a vice president, vice president from the North, and the Senate president from the East, as it were, who was an Igbo man. Now, they refused to make it, he was not confirmed as the SGF anymore, which was supposed to be like number six or whatever in the hierarchy, because he was an Igbo man. So at that time, it was, he, he conveniently lost that position because he was Igbo. But they didn't remember that he was also South-South, because the whole idea they said they had to look for a true South-South uh, Nigerian, and that's how Ufo Tekaite was made the secretary to the government. So you see, when it's convenient, we are not Igbos. When it's convenient, we are South-South. When it's convenient, we are not South-South. When it's not convenient, we are not Igbos. So you see, they can't keep picking and choosing for us all the time. You know, and um, it is particularly heart-wrenching when I see, you know, hey, we know how Nigeria works. Whether an Igbo man will be president, only God knows. Uh, personally, I want to see that happen, you know, even if you say yes, the Igbos from the southeast, you know, have not enjoyed it at this time. But also the Igbos from Anyota Oshimili, who have a skin in the game, and who have suffered everything the Igbo man from across the Niger has suffered, has also never been. Don't forget that when Midwest was a region, the first premier, that is the only region that was even created by a referendum in Nigeria, when there were just four regions in Nigeria. The first premier was Chief Dennis Osadibe. Yes, he was from Asaba. And he was the premier of Midwest State. I mean, I mean yeah, Midwest region, rather. So what I'm saying is that 
we never lacked the manpower, the capacity of human beings or that human capital that can deliver on that kind of man mandate as the president of Nigeria. So to keep shutting the door at us, using all these you know, little, little um, colorations that are always brought into the matter, you are south-south now, you are not Igbo now, you are not uh, mainstream Igbo, it just doesn't make sense to me. That is the truth. But what about those who shut the door against themselves? You have prominent politicians in this country who switch hats, depending on which way the wind is blowing. They also choose to be south-south one day and, you know, southeast the next day. I'd like you to address that. And who in Anyocha or Shimili are you thinking of? Are you also throwing your hat in the ring? Because we've had, like, a series of guests of late using this platform to make, you know, declarations here. I want to tell you something. I am not interested in politics at all, not even about being president of Nigeria. I, you know, I've, I've left that field. Because what you just said to do doesn't make sense to me as a person. You know, we can't keep shifting the goalpost when this game is being played. And that is all that goes on in Nigeria. And that is because the polity, I keep saying, is devoid of any kind of ideology. So Zero. people just use these um, political platforms as platforms to try and hijack power for themselves and their friends and their families and whatever they do and all of that. So that does not interest me at all. I just want to put the, the, the record straight in terms of what it is we are doing as a country. You see, there are too many injustices in Nigeria already that we are complaining about. I, as an Igbo man, am complaining that an Igbo man has not been president. So while I'm complaining about that and feeling, you know, a little bit shortchanged there, not because an Igbo man being president is going to make it any better for me, because you see, I'm a pan-Nigerian by my birth and by the kind of life I've lived. I'm one of the few Nigerians that can tell you, right, Tundu, that I am from every part of Nigeria. My mother is from Kogi State, a town called Ogori, but she is of Yoruba ethnic stock. So that makes her a, a southwesterner and also a northerner. My father is from Asaba, but he is Igbo. And that is what we are talking about here. That makes me come from the south-south as a geopolitical zone and an Igbo man. So what I'm trying to say is simple. Whatever we do, let us just be true to ourselves. Because if we keep shifting this goalpost just to favor you know, our own selfish interest at that time, then it will always come back to haunt us. And that is why the problem is like this. That is why the problem with political leadership in Nigeria is intractable. And that is why we must get to a point where it has to just be about meritocracy. When your father was um, ran for the presidency of Nigeria, who remembered where he came from? He united the whole country. And everybody voted for him. That is the kind of Nigeria we're looking forward to having. When Obasanjo was president, even his own people from Southwest did not want him, but he was made president of Nigeria by everybody else in Nigeria. Now some people even come on TV and tell us that um, the Igbos are constantly against themselves, which is beginning to look like, because here I am, an Igbo man, and I'm shouting that, yes, you, you can't keep saying to us that we are not Igbos. You know, they say we should reach out to other, other um, ethnic groups and all of that. Even other ethnic groups, nobody, you know, that, that is one of the biggest lies they keep selling in Nigeria. No ethnic group is heterogeneous in its thinking and all of that. In fact, most politicians, I can assure you, if you look at the, the political trajectory of Nigeria, their greatest traducers have always been the ones from their villages, from their towns, and from their states. It's not even the ones from other places. So what are we saying? Okay, you meant homogeneous uh, in their yeah. thinking, not heterogeneous, I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, just like the argument that the North have had, uh, have had, you know, a lot of Nigerian presidents, yet the North still remains very poor and uh, very, very devoid of development. Let me use that word. But I want to talk about that point you raised because everybody says that we had Kashim here, Alaji Kashim here, uh, in the course of the week, I, I think. He said the same thing, that the Igbos don't reach out, they're not doing deals. I even remember of blessed memories, uh, of, of blessed memory, I should say. Isa Funtua was here too, and he said the same. You know, they're not going. I can't hear you well. Can you hear me? I have better now. Good. 
I said we had uh, Alaji Kashim here. It said the same thing, that the Igbos don't reach out. Okay. Secondly, I remember Isa Funtua of blessed memory. Said the same thing while he was here. I think the last interview he granted before he passed was on a rise, I think it was January, maybe last year or thereabout. He said the same thing. Oh, you're not reaching out to do deals. How best can you do that deal? How best can you reach out? Can an average Igbo man reach out and do that deal across other parts of the country? 